Well, illumination gonna illuminate, I guess. Okay, okay, look, guys, this isn't just gonna be 20 minutes of me dunking on the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah, okay, it's clearly Illumination's attempt at doing the Lego movie, a film that is way above Illumination standards. The Lego movie got to the heart of creativity and imagination, and why kids love Legos, and how adults have lost that inner child along the way. They took an idea that, quite frankly, shouldn't work, and made it emotionally compelling. Here, Illumination is just interested in playing it safe with Mario, pandering to the fans to nostalgia, and, as they always do, creating the most low-hanging fruit filmscape they possibly can for kids. Because why respect their intelligence? Yes, the Super Mario Bros. movie is hollow. We should expect more from a film aimed at children, even if this Mario movie is fun and enjoyable on the surface. There's no real characters, emotions, or stakes. It's just just an abridged Mario game. Wait, 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 wait. Except, what if there is more to say here? What if, for all the usual illumination trappings and nonsense afoot, this has more guts than maybe any of the studio's previous films? Look, before you do a world skip and switch over to a vicious takedown, hear me out. Because I'm gonna read way deeper into the Super Mario Brothers movie than anyone else, even if its screenplay is in another castle. All right, this is going to sound absolutely absurd, but stick with me here. There's something inherently relatable about Mario, a New York Italian, probably second generation or something, who knows, who works as a plumber, takes pride in his craft, and accomplishes feats larger than himself in pursuit of his dream. He represents the blue collar everyday person who works hard to achieve success. Mario is you or I, he's just a dude, and yeah, while he may have power-ups that help him along the way, those don't necessarily come easy. He has to work hard to obtain them, and sometimes they aren't what he wants or needs, presenting more of a challenge. Either way, the power-ups are only as effective or detrimental to the hero wielding it. Mario's determination, vigor, and good-heartedness is what makes the difference, is what amplifies the power he receives. Coming from what I assume is an Italian immigrant background, because the film really gives me nothing to work with, but hey, I can buy the Mario immigration story. His family knows firsthand the struggles and hardships that come with immigrating to America. Faced with assimilation and yet trying to preserve their heritage and the spirit of who they are, and although they may have faced mistreatment, they persevered and built a life for themselves. They adopted Brooklyn, New York, America as a whole, as their home, living out the American dream. For Mario and Luigi being the best plumbers in Brooklyn, something more, something great, making a difference and achieving their American dream is their mission, even if their family disapproves. As they enter the Mushroom Kingdom, Mario and Luigi experience their own immigrant story, with the new land becoming as much a home to them as Brooklyn. They become children of two worlds, and Brooklyn representing their motherland akin to that of Italy, and the Mushroom World their new home akin to that of America with their found family. Additionally, the Mushroom World represents a place where people and creatures of all walks of life can coexist and live harmoniously in one realm. Well, mostly. I mean, it's a place where walking toadstools, killer turtles, ghosts, apes, and humans can work and fight alongside or against one another. It's a place where anything is possible. The Mushroom World is an allegory for America, and what it represents and could be to so many, and especially immigrants, a place where everyone can coexist and live harmoniously regardless of their background of origin. It's the Land of Oz to Dorothy's Kansas or Alice's Rabbit Hole, a world used to examine and comment on our own while advancing our hero through their own personal journey. In the Mushroom World, Mario and Luigi never forget their roots and can always return to their original home, but they found a new purpose and calling in the Mushroom World. Here, their size doesn't matter. They can be whoever they want to be, be great, discover a purpose, a calling, actually achieve their dream, and their actions make a difference. 
For Mario, this is particularly true, as he embodies the idea of the underdog, the everyman, the unlikely hero, making him appealing in both a macro and micro context. So while it may seem like a big stretch to read so much into a Mario movie, the heart of the character lies in his relatability and appeal to the common person. This is something that extends beyond the character as well. I just wish they gave Luigi some more focus too. For a movie with Super Mario Brothers in its title, we don't really get much in the way of them being brothers, and we only really get a storyline for one of them. Luigi is separated from Mario early on in the story and forced to go it alone. He's clearly a bit codependent and afraid. He has to learn courage and grow into himself apart from Mario, which is a perfect storyline for him, except the movie doesn't actually flesh it out at all. Like, give me a fucking Luigi's Mansion movie now! As soon as he stepped inside that house, I thought, okay, this is where we get some depth for Luigi. And then he's immediately captured by Bowser's minions, and that's it. He spends the rest of the movie in a cell. I understand the point in separating the brothers, discovering their respective internal strengths so they're more powerful together, but if they weren't going to give us more of them on screen, more of what made that first act great, we should have at least gotten more Luigi. I don't really feel like he ever discovered that inner strength until a brief moment at the end. I felt the hint of a genuine emotional core there with the brothers and their relationship with one another. They don't need to be codependent, but they need to know how to work well as a team as well as flourish when they're not together. I don't know if it's Nintendo or Illumination to blame here, but a better studio would have leaned into that, not away from it. In a meta sense, the film takes a look at the success of Mario and the brand as a whole. This tiny little playable character in a Donkey Kong game who grew into something much larger, spawning a series of his own, multiple spin-offs, and even eclipsing Donkey Kong himself in popularity. Mario was just this little dude no one expected to be more than an 8-bit extension of a controller, and through each subsequent installment, grew bigger in size and popularity as he also grew fonder in our hearts, even going so far as to save the video game industry from collapse in the 80s. This little Italian plumber and his pals were able to accomplish a feat larger than themselves, which I think in truth is the ethos of Mario and the games. Even the smallest and seemingly weakest character can become a powerful hero capable of extraordinary things. And that's put at the forefront of the movie. Mario's just an average guy with a simple backstory. A plumber who gets transported to a fantasy world to save someone, whether it's Peach in the games, or his brother Luigi in the movie, or whatever. This simplicity is part of what makes him so appealing. Players can project themselves onto Mario and imagine themselves in his shoes, which creates a sense of connection and empathy because, again, Mario's just a guy like you and me. By being this vessel of resilience and exploration, he's arguably one of the most accessible characters in all of fiction. That accessibility is not only one of the highlights of the games, but it's also what makes the movie such a universal viewing experience. You don't have to go back and play like 20 Mario games in order to understand what's going on in the newest one. All you have to know is that Mario has to stop a bad guy, whether it's Bowser or Bowser Jr. or King Boo, whoever, and save whoever, and there are a bunch of quests, obstacle courses, and fun platforming along the way. The point is, anyone can jump in and play at any age. Anyone can jump into this film and have a fun time at any age. They're timeless and perhaps a bit old fashioned, but that's the charm of it. No other game series is like that and still as popular as it is today. The Mario franchise is known for its whimsical and joyful nature, which sets it apart from most of today's most popular video games that often explore darker, grittier, more mature themes. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the Mario games remind us of positivity and joy in the world, capture that childlike sense of awe, wonder, and optimism, even among the cynicism, graphic violence, and deconstruction prevalent in modern gaming. Again, I love a good first-person shooter or emotionally shattering third-person RPG, shout out to The Last of Us and Mass Effect, but Mario is special in how it's the perfect antidote to all of that. What makes the Mario franchise so special is its ability to celebrate the best of life and humanity through fun adventures and activities. 
Whether it's racing ridiculously souped up go-karts, kicking a soccer ball so hard it fucking explodes, or saving the Mushroom Kingdom from Bowser, the games are all about having a good time and enjoying life. So what more could you ask for in a film that does exactly that? It's just a fun ride at the movies where we get to watch Mario and his buds do absurdly fantastical things, complete elaborate obstacle courses with ease, and race on the iconic Rainbow Road. Obviously, it's not the end-all be-all of adaptations, but the film does bring it when it counts. One of the key elements that makes the Mario characters so memorable is their ability to adapt to any situation. They embody basic archetypes such as the hero, the damsel in distress, the wise mentor, and the comic relief, which makes them easy to connect with and care about. Players can immediately feel for them and the circumstances they find themselves in because, again, the characters are vessels for us, going back to the everyman aspect of the character. This adaptability is what makes the Mario games so immersive and entertaining, as players are transported to a world where anything is possible. Given how hollow these characters are in the film, it actually makes it easy for us to attach to the basic feeling of being swept up in a new world. The archetypes work in favor of the film and makes for another universal element that a 5-year-old and 70-year-old can understand. They can be on the same page while experiencing the same thing, which is pretty rare nowadays when it comes to films. Mario and his friends are playful, fun, and and easy to understand, but they're also malleable. They can be serious, sad, frightened, in love, angry when the situation calls for it. Just look at Luigi's Mansion. These characters represent the ultimate escapist power fantasy, where players can step into the shoes of an avatar and live out their wildest dreams, just as Mario in the film steps into the mushroom world to live out his long sought after dream. It's his place to finally become the hero he dreams of being back in Brooklyn, in an industry that often glorifies space marines, vigilantes, assassins, tough guys, and the fucking military, Mario is a refreshing change of pace. He's a stout little Italian man who loves to eat, is underestimated at every corner, falls off of platforms, gets smacked around by Donkey Kong, torched by Bowser, eaten by piranha plants, he gets beat the fuck up left and right, yet always manages to come out on top. He's the goddamn Rocky Balboa of video game characters. He's one of, if not THE video game character to end all video game characters, and yet, he's still the underdog. He's still not given the proper credit he deserves. Hell, I'd argue we all take him for granted at this point. And so, even when he's proven himself, people struggle to see him for the remarkable individual he is. Maybe it's the goofy Italian accent, the ridiculous outfit and hat, white gloves, stuff that's a caricature and embarrassing. Who knows? I mean, in the film, that's what his family, especially his father, sees. He doesn't see someone with potential, ingenuity, and a knack for branding and standing apart. He doesn't see this small man with big dreams and aspirations and the means to achieve it. He just sees a disappointment. Someone who's using their Italian heritage as a marketing ploy, playing into stereotypes they probably tried to shed upon first arriving to America, and not being a realist about his his future and how that reflects poorly on the family. I mean, who the hell can't relate to that? We've all been underestimated at some point in our lives, with lofty ambitions and people, likely relatives, who've tried to dissuade us from pursuing them. Again, Mario is us. This relatability is also what makes him a great underdog in the games and in the film. We can't help but root for him when he's up against seemingly insurmountable odds. And it's not like it's that complex of an idea. I mean, shit, I absolutely just gave the film way more credit in that department than it deserves because it did the barest of bare minimums to get us invested, but because it's Mario, it fucking works. But the idea of the underdog, something so straightforward and simple, something we all collectively rally behind, that's the driving force behind Mario 
and Luigi. It's that primal instinct to root for the little guy because we know that person. The Mario franchise is a testament to the power of simplicity in storytelling. By sticking to basic archetypes and creating characters that are easy to care about, Nintendo has created one of the most enduring and beloved franchises in video game history and now the most profitable animated film ever made. While the world building in the film is less building and more showing, it's still a really fun and vibrant world to be in. It's unfortunate in a way because, given the brisk pace, you don't get to spend nearly enough time at any given moment just basking in the world as you'd like. I don't mind the fast pace, but it contributes to the overall forgettability of the film, with no real emotional core to latch onto, and each location serving more as a vista than a fully realized world. It plays more like a greatest hits demo, giving you a small taste of all these different Mario games rather than a full narrative experience. In that regard, it does feel a bit like a long form ad for the games. I guess, ultimately, the film is a bit too haphazard for its own good. Mario just meets people and gets what he wants and then immediately moves on. It's a series of very functional, utilitarian writing and quick exchanges that follow, almost always, the path of least resistance. And yeah, that doesn't really work in a film the way it does in a video game, especially a Mario one. In the Mario games, we don't really care too much about character interactions, they're so light on dialogue and emotions, but they get the point across. That doesn't translate to film. Like, at all. You need a script. You need to write fully fleshed out conversations instead of cutting them off at the knees. Even still, at least the filmmakers were trying to stay true to the games, even if it can be a detriment at times. This is exactly what the film captures. The spirit of the Mario games, faults and all. I'm not saying it's a perfect adaptation, hell, it's just barely a serviceable one, and I think perhaps the filmmaker should have taken into account the difference in mediums and what you need to do for a film to work, aka an actual script with three-dimensional characters, but nevertheless, the fun, excitement, breeziness, accessibility, simplicity, and endearingness are present in the film. Look, if you're coming into this movie for the Mario aesthetic and you want to feel like you're being surrounded by the sensory experience of Super Mario Odyssey or insert your favorite Mario game in there, this movie is going to give you more than your money's worth. The Mario games are all about platforming and fluid movement. It's a vital element to the series, and the movie is kind of always giving you that. The pacing and dynamism of the action and plot help emulate the feeling you get playing a Mario game, and I'll credit the animators for trying to engage with all eras of the evolution of the games and all generations of the series' fans. You have sequences framed like the side-scrolling platformers of the NES games, the obstacle course through the construction site in Brooklyn is a particular highlight, and then others which are captured in the way a 3D platformer such as Super Mario 64's third-person camera would, the obligatory Mario Kart sequence, and then the showstoppers modeled after the wildly dynamic, huge set pieces and battles of the newest Mario games, in turn honoring the light years of technological advances that these games have often spearheaded and the gamer's experience comes through in the story as well. Mario discovers the world the way we would while playing one of his games for the first time. He goes through a training montage, albeit a very eye-rolling one where they use I Need a Hero, which why would you ever do that after Shrek 2 perfected that? Anyways, he has to learn to perfect his abilities and it's very similar to players getting accustomed to the movement and controls of a new Mario game and trying to master that so they can fly through the subsequent levels like a pro, which is precisely what Mario goes on to do. It's arguably the most admirable thing about the entire film, how the production so dearly adores and honors these games that we, the audience, love just as much. And Brian Tyler's score? What? Holy shit! For me, that's the highlight of the film. Who told him to pop off as hard as he did? I mean, it's probably his best work to date, and I say that as someone who genuinely thinks he's made a couple of the better, more memorable film scores of the past decade. From start to finish, it's a real earworm that runs the gamut of Mario Music's greatest hits, while integrating some new and equally as fitting themes as well. The game have some of the best, most joyful and poppy video games 
game music of all time, and they have the most perfect, vibrant visuals to pair with it. Without these elements, Mario would just be another platformer. The games have been defined from the start by their hyper dreamlike aesthetic. It's essential to the identity of the games that they look and sound the way they do, and it's equally as essential to the success of the movie as well. Like, I don't think this movie works without Brian Tyler's score. It breathes so much life into what's otherwise a hollow demo. It's beautiful. But on the other end of the musical scale, the needle drops are truly the worst. Like, they're Illumination's typical uninspired trash that takes you out of whatever is going on. Like, what relevance does Take On Me have to Mario being escorted via go-kart through the Kong jungle? There's so much randomness to the film in general. Again, just as is typical for Illumination, but like here, there's like an interesting thing going on, and then it's just Take On Me. There are an endless onslaught of pointless asides that become increasingly grating when you realize that it's time they could have spent elsewhere. The best and most compelling stuff is easily the Mario and Luigi stuff, and we barely even get any of it. The lack of a script, as I've already mentioned, and a sincere attempt at emotional connections with and between the characters is glaringly evident. I heard Nintendo was apparently very strict with what the filmmakers could and couldn't do with the story and characters, and unfortunately, I think that contributed to the shallow, if not hollowness, of the overall story. I mean, look, there's something there, clearly, with how much I've extrapolated so far, but it's nothing more than dry bones, a skeleton. Hopefully, the success of the film proves to Nintendo that Mario Mario movies are a lucrative idea and one you can just sink a smidge more effort into writing-wise. The film's through-line of size trickles down into many aspects of the story. Now, it's not explicitly mentioned in the film, but hey, I mean, if we're gonna read entirely too much into the Mario movie, then we're gonna fucking read entirely too much into the Mario movie. You get the sense that Toad, this small, adorable mushroomling, is a loner searching for a family and purpose. His eagerness to help Mario comes from an eagerness to be a part of something bigger than himself, which makes him a companion Mario can relate to. The idea behind the Mushroom Kingdom finding Peach as a kid and raising her to be their princess shows that all the Toads want to be in service of something greater than themselves. They want to uplift someone who can make their world a better place and have a hand in creating the prosperous mushroom kingdom they want. Not too dissimilar from the immigrants who came to America. Italian immigrants, perhaps? Mario's relatives? Uh, you see where I'm getting with that? I'm bringing it back. I'm bringing it back to the immigrant story, to the Mario immigrant story. Bowser is a massive monster of a turtle who needs legions of smaller turtles to do his bidding and take over the world. The irony is, He's a turtle, a traditionally small reptile. Most of the main protagonists are smaller people who manage to accomplish great things, whether it's Mario or Peach or all of the Toads. Donkey Kong is a massive gorilla who is capable but perhaps lacks the brains, while Luigi is taller than Mario but far less confident and constantly afraid of everything. He has to find the courage within himself to fill out the size of the man he is. Luma is an existential star talking about our place in the universe and the insignificance of our lives. Peach talks about the fact that she doesn't know where she came from, alluding to the fact that we are all small in the grand scope of things. The key is to take the largeness and vastness and shrink it down to your level. The world is a big place. Make it feel smaller, more digestible, more relatable. Size is only what you make of it. You can grow into something bigger. Big bullies aren't really all that big in the grand scheme of things. Make them feel small. They may be bigger than you, but that doesn't make them stronger. Most of the time, those bullies are insecure man babies, as seen with Bowser who wants nothing more than to marry Peach because he thinks she's hot and he's lonely. He doesn't have any friends or family or relationships. He only has servants and legions of Koopas, Goombas, and whatever to do his bidding because he intimidates them. He forces their cooperation. Contrast this to Mario, who cultivates relationships, befriends people of all walks of life, and accomplishes great things with them as a team. 
Mario is willing to get his hands dirty, whereas Bowser will only as a last resort. And when it comes to the other characters, like Donkey Kong, aside from the sheer absurdity of seeing DK and then hearing Seth Rogen's voice and laugh, he and Mario have a fun dynamic that shows they're more alike than they initially think. For starters, they both clearly have daddy issues. For DK, his father, Cranky Kong, is a ruler who only views him as useful when he needs muscle. He's nothing more than a himbo, which isn't entirely wrong. I mean, just Donkey Kong in general is probably one of the biggest himbos in all of fiction. Anyways, obviously, this stems from DK desperately seeking his father's approval, being a showboater in need of adoration from the public, particularly in the arena, where the spotlight is on him because his father doesn't give him enough attention. In the end, both Mario and DK miraculously find a way to overcome their daddy issues and prove their worth in their own way. Even, even if they don't really explain it, it just kind of happens. His dad just kind of loves him at the end, and then Mario becomes the hero of both worlds he's come to be a part of and love, and DK acts selflessly and heroically for once to save his father and the rest of the Kong army being held captive by Bowser. This growth in their respective characters is a testament to the strength of their relationship both as rivals and as friends, and it serves to finish out that personal story arc Mario was having with his father. Mario's dad is finally able to see him, see what he's capable of, see what can be done despite his size. It's a testament to believing in yourself and knowing you can accomplish what you set out to do. And I, uh, I think that's about it. Was that fun? Did you enjoy taking a deeper dive into the Super Mario Brothers movie than anyone else probably ever will? No one was asking for the Mario movie to have dense thematic depth or art house cinema ambitions, but I don't know, just maybe you could have had a little bit more, just maybe a second draft of the script that didn't have AI written dialogue. But it would have been nice, I don't know, if the film had something, just a little bit more effort put into it. Like, I guess when it comes down to it, I just don't understand why this movie was a job. Like, it was a guaranteed hit. Whether or not it would have made a billion dollars, I think it's going to at this point. Clearly, the interest was there, the passion and love from the fans was there. It has Super Mario Brothers in the title. I don't know why they played it so safe. And because they played it so safe, it almost went full circle and bit them in the ass, becoming a risk. Releasing a movie without any real narrative through line is almost avant-garde, dare I say? The Super Mario Brothers movie was so safe, it was subversive, it inadvertently became a bit of art house cinema. That's right, you heard it here first, folks. The Mario movie is a structureless, formless, surrealist piece. Let's take it further next time and really double down on honoring Italian cinema. Let's have Chris Pratt ride Yoshi in a Sergio Leone-inspired spaghetti western. Get Danny DeVito as Wario, Steve Buscemi as Waluigi for Luigi's Mansion adaptation, and maybe we even honor more Italian cinema by making it a giallo! Giallo!